All right, I've handed out a book, two books to everybody. Hopefully you got one. If you haven't, there's one left of the thick book and a couple left of the other one. And also, everybody should have a handout. And that's what we're going to go through. Um, this week, I was going to just try to teach all this, but then I remembered Dave so nicely does a little outline, and Joe does a nice outline, a lot thicker than mine. <laughs> what about mine? <laughs> and, and Darby, uh, he's, he's a train wreck over there. <laughs> um, but um, So I figured, you know, why not take this and put it down? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, one word for the peanut gallery. Don't worry about the watch. Go oh. as the spirit leads. Okay, amen. That's it. Thank you. you know, so, printing this up, we actually had a printer burn up on us, trying to print all this material up. Um, so... But we got this, and what I want you to take this with you in case you never know when you need to use it. And uh, there's so many different angles you can come at and teach on this. It's like, how do you get all this together into one teaching? So I got a homiletical outline. No, <laughs> no I did get an outline, and it all starts with T, which is interesting. So uh, T is the cross, I guess. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why the King James Version. Why King James only? A lot of people in the world today don't know anything about this. And what's so sad is many people in the world today, uh, not only are they ignorant, they're willingly ignorant of why the King James is the Word of God. And you go to most Bible schools, and they will teach you, oh, we love the King James, but you get behind closed doors, the first thing they do is say, oh, it's full of errors and mistakes, and you need to learn the Hebrew and Greek so you can find out what God really said. And what you find out is what God really said is whatever you think he said, because they try to teach you, you're your own God, you can decide what it says. No, that's not the way it works. We're going to look at the Bible itself and see that the Bible is true, God gave it to the world, He preserved it, and it's got to be somewhere, so where is it, and how can we know where it is? Um, so, let's look at the handout here. Um, first of all, I'm going to give a testimony really quick, and I'm going to try to get through this. We're going to read some verses, some we won't, and I think there's about 13, 14 pages, so I think if we skip a few things and just go over things, this is more like an outline, a summary, it's not an in-depth teaching <laughs> of six hours. But I believe we can get through it. So when I was six, I remember my dad gave me a King James Bible. I still got it. It's a little one, black. Its name is in the front. It says 1981 on it. And um, I'd read that every night, and I understood it. I didn't have any problems. A lot of people today say, oh, you can't understand the King James. Well, I understood it. And I tried reading other ones, and I didn't understand them. They didn't make sense. Actually, they've done what they call the flesh I forget, Fleisch Kincaid reading test on all the different Bibles. And the King James comes in at about a sixth grade reading level. And other Bibles are seven, eight, nine. So they're actually harder to understand. And yet they say, don't read the King James, it's too hard to understand. That's lie number one. <laughs> and so I used to read the King James Bible. Uh, later, as I got older, I got a hold of this book by Gail Ripplinger, New Age Bible Versions. And the premise of this book is that there is a conspiracy against the King James Bible. And she shows that the new versions are not based on the same text that the King James comes from. And these new versions have an agenda. It's to bring in, as we got here on the paper, a new world order and a new world religion under the Antichrist. And she goes in verse by verse and shows you how they change with every version a little closer, a little closer. And it reads just with New Age doctrine. And if you know the Bible, you know in the last days the Antichrist is going to take over in tribulation. And guess what? He's going to have his own Bible. And it's going to say that he is God. And people are going to come in and accept him. The big term is the one. And New Age Bibles, was what she calls them, New Age Bible versions, they always talk about the one, the one. Well, who is the one? That's going to be the Antichrist that comes in. Hindus, all those different religions, all talk about the one. And they're all going to have one Bible when the Antichrist comes in that talks about the God is the one. So that's my testimony, a little bit about it. I went to college, went to secular college. And I noticed it said, write this research paper on one of these topics. And the very last one was, why the King James Bible is the Word of God. So in a secular college, I wrote a research paper, why the King James Bible is the Word of God, and I got a C. <laughs> and on it, it said in big words, do not like the topic. <laughs> well, obviously, for some reason, secular colleges don't like the King James Bible. So why was that even the topic that I could write on? But that's one of the things this book by Gail Ripplinger was able to put that together. And these new versions do affect doctrine. Lie number two that they'll tell you today is, oh, no new version of the Bible affects doctrine. Yes, it does. If we get to the end here, i just give a couple examples because it does attack the deity of Jesus Christ. So uh, what I gave you guys is this book. i got it right here. This book here was written by a friend of mine named Jeff Johnson, 
It's called Spiritual Deception in the Highest, and it does a great job of showing that these new versions are done by deceiving spirits. And there's a spiritual thing there where they're attacking the Word of God and giving you false versions of Scripture. I know it's kind of thick, but it's a great book. So I figured it's worth printing up so you'd have a copy and just give you, what do they do in the army? They give you the weapons, they give you the ammo to go fight the fight. So try to give you as much ammo as I can to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? All right, so number two, the time period we now live in. According to the Bible, we are where? We're in the last days in a time of apostasy. I firmly believe that. It cannot be denied. And look what the Bible says is going to happen in the last days. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verse, probably won't read all of these, but 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible tells us, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We are definitely in perilous times. I mean, there's Muslims killing people and everything all over the world. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And it goes on and on. And it says, verse 4, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then in verse uh, 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the day and age in which we live. People talk and talk and talk about all the things they know, but they never really come to the truth. And we'll see by the end of this study how you can't miss it if you just look at the facts. That the King James Bible, that's it. That's God's word for us today in English. And there's a lot more that it, it talks about, but in verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. That's what's so important about the Bible. It tells us how to be saved. Why would we want someone to change that? Well, that's going to water it down. It's going to make it harder to get saved. I heard Joe said that many times. I remember Joe saying that. So now let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 about what's happening in these last days. So 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Actually, let's just read verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We are in the last days when people have been deceived by seducing spirits. There are demonic forces that are going around deceiving people. And when it comes to the Bible issue, they have deceived people. As a matter of fact, some Bibles have actually been translated using spirits. The Jehovah Witnesses have a New Testament in Greek done by a man. And that man's wife was a channel, a spirit channel guide. And he would do his work and ask her, now what does the channel guide tell me to say? And he actually made a translation of the Greek New Testament based upon what his wife's demon, is what I'll call it, told her to say. And what do you expect? It, it downgrades the deity of Jesus Christ. So we see that demons are working hard to get rid of the Word of God. So when did this apostasy begin? I say around the 1700s with German rationalism. If you don't know what German rationalism is, it's a teaching that, oh, there weren't any miracles in the Bible. And the Germans, because they're always so smart, you know, oh, that didn't really happen. And eventually, in the 1800s, that led rise to what they call higher criticism and textual criticism. And they taught that the Bible had errors and mistakes, and that they believed that the older, uh, the older versions that had been recently found were the better. So the argument was, the older the text is, the better it is. Well, that's not always right. Because if I'm actually reading the Bible, I'm going to wear it out. So my good Bible will be gone. But if I have a Bible that's a perversion, like those over there, look how good shape those are. Those are going to last longer because I'm not reading those. So the older the text, that's not better. The actual copies of copies of copies that go back to the source are the ones that we accept, rather than the ones that are actually the oldest ones in existence. So we know that in 1455, Johann Gutenberg produced the first Bible ever printed on a press, and it was a Bible. And then later, God gave us the, the King James Authorized Version in 1611. And there was more revival throughout the world during that time after the King James of any time on earth. I don't know if you're familiar with the Victorian age in the 1800s, but the King James Bible had gone over the whole world. And it said that, that men who were sailors would blush if they cussed in front of a kid. Because the whole world had been so saturated with the gospel that even people that weren't saved were ashamed when they did wrong. That's some revival right there. Then in 1881, two guys came along, Westcott and Horst, and they produced a new Greek text. And we're going to look at that. It's horrible. And then in 1884, the first new translation in English was made called the Revised Version. And now today, there are over 200 different English versions, all claiming to be the Word of God. But where's the revival? Is there revival today? Rather, there's apostasy. 
So you see the fruit of the King James, now compare that with the fruit of these 200 different ones, and the fruit of these new versions is apathy, not revival. Very few Christians are dogmatic and want to do something, they're just, nah, that's <laughs> the attitude today is, oh, whatever, easy going, whatever Bible you use, it's your preference. So there's no standard, there's no authority, it's whatever you want to use. I call it the effeminization of Christianity. It's an effeminate attitude of, hmm. you know, well, where's the men? Men are more militant, you know. Paul said, fight the good fight. Not that that's good, but sometimes it is when it comes to earnestly contending for the faith, like the Bible says. So, number three, we're getting to the first page, all right. What the Bible says about itself, its own testimony of what it is and where it came from. Now, this is what's so important, is there's two main doctrines that are so important when it comes to studying the Bible. The doctrine of inspiration and the doctrine of preservation. But most Christians and Christian Bible schools today only believe in the first one and they reject right. the second one. That's what's so sad because you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. If God just inspired his word, but then we don't have it and it's lost, then what good is that? What God is that? That's a horrible God that can inspire a word and then say, well, I'm sorry, I lost it. That's ridiculous. If he's powerful enough to inspire it, he must be powerful enough to preserve Amen. it, and we can still find it today. Amen? Mm -hmm. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, look at verse 19 through 21, and this shows us where the Bible comes from. And it's so important because if you go to secular college, I went one year and I said, I've had enough of this. So I went three years to Bible school. It was a three-year school, so I've had four years of higher education or whatever. And um, would have come out dumber than before if I'd stayed in the secular school. <laughs> but they'll tell you, oh, I don't believe the Bible. Man wrote that. That's the main thing the world says. Oh, that, no, that's just a book that man wrote. Well, is that true? Let's look at this verse. Second Peter shows they've never read the Bible because the Bible doesn't say that. <coughs> Second Peter 1, 19 through 21. Talking about the Bible, it says, we, all, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein to you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now verse 21 is our text for inspiration. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Do you see that word moved? That's removed in all new versions. What happened was God spoke through them His words. So what were inspired? The men or the words? Modern liberals will tell you the men were inspired. Well, it's easy for a man to become inspired and write something. Dave's told us many times he gets inspired to sit down and write and just write. He's written several books. I've written a couple of books as well. Sometimes you just get inspired and just want to write. But that's you. But according to the Bible, the words that we have are whose words? God's. And he just moved the lips of those men to speak his inspired words. So it's not the men that were inspired. It was the words because they're God's inspired. That is so important. Do you guys understand that? I mean, that's so important because new versions change it. And they say, no, just the men were inspired. Well, if just the men were inspired, then they are true when they say it's just a book that man wrote. But no, it's a book that God wrote. I like to say it's like this. You sit down and you write a story at a typewriter at a computer. When it's all done and you print it up, do you write Apple Computer as the author? <laughs> or do you write your name? Well, who wrote the book? You did, but it was actually written on the computer or on the typewriter. But that was just a tool to give your words to the world. So the men were just a tool of God to give his words to the world. And God moved their lips to speak the God's inspired word. Okay? Do we understand that? So modernists don't believe that. They believe just the men are inspired. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16 as well. And this is where we see how just utterly insane many modern scholars are because they refuse to believe the Bible. They want the men to be inspired. And what we'll see here is they want inspiration to be true, but they don't want preservation. Because God inspired it and preserved it, then they have no job. Because their job is to try to tell you, oh, well, I found it and you didn't. So they don't want the second one. But what is the first one? Inspiration. Here we find inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. 
So the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of man. Is that what it says? Yeah. No, but that's what they try to tell you. Oh, men were inspired. No, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for us, for doctrine, for proof, for correction. So the Bible teaches inspiration. What is inspired? The scriptures. That makes the question, what are the, what are the scriptures? All modern scholars today will tell you, um, and they're apostates because they say that, that only the original autographs, that's the actual handwritten first edition written by these men, are the inspired word of God. And they actually say a copy isn't inspired. How can that be? If that's true, do we have the word of God, the inspired word of God? Not one exists today of the original ones that they wrote down. Yet modern scholars say this. So the question, do we have any original autographs today? Then we don't have a Bible according to what they teach. Modern day fundamentalists believe that only the original autographs are inspired and copies of them cannot be inspired. And if this is the case, do we even have a Bible? Where are these original autographs? Now go to the next page with me. And you might think I'm just talking. Well, I want to give you an example. One of the biggest Bible schools in America, probably in the world, is Bob Jones University. And they, and they call themselves a bastion of orthodoxy, is what they call themselves. We are the most fundamentalist Bible school in the world. And I actually visited there, and I was just like, oh, there were so many effeminate people. It's gross. I said, I'd like to take a tour when I went and visited. And this guy goes, I'll give you a tour. I said, I'd like a man to give me a tour. And he went, oh, and walked away, and somebody else came out. I was like, weird. So, um, yeah, you claim that this is the bastion of orthodoxy. Okay. Well, let's see what they say about the inspiration. Okay. Here's their quote. We believe in the verbal inspiration and absolute inerrancy of the Bible. Doesn't that sound great? We believe, as fundamentalists have always believed, that this inspiration refers to the original manuscript. What? <laughs> we, the record for whose inspirited we contend is the original record. The autographs are parchments of Moses, David, Daniel, Matthew, Peter, or Paul, as the case may be, and not any particular translation or translations of them whatsoever. So according to that, they don't believe the King James Bible. They believe the only inspired word is the actual ones written down at the first. So where's the Bible? Because those don't exist anymore. What a dumb thing to believe. You cannot believe in inspiration without preservation. Do you see that? Yet that's what they say they believe. And no translation of them whatsoever. So what we've written here is most modern day fundamentalists, and I put in parentheses funny mentalists, because they're kind of mental, aren't they? They can't think. Go ahead. When did, uh, when did the young Bob Jones change things? Because the old man wasn't like that, I don't believe. The old man Bob Jones was an evangelist. <clears throat> he cared more about going church to church and preaching. And he started that Bible school, and he gave it over to people to, to run. So, and, that, and that's when they apostatized. Well, right? they started out pretty good, but yeah. he put people in charge to preach the Bible, and he didn't know much about the Bible. He just, like most preachers of the time, believed the King James. He didn't know anything. So when he let them preach in the Bible classes, they'd say, King James, King James, and then they'd say, but it's got errors. And in the classroom, they'd preach against it. And Mr. Bob, the, the first founder of that school, I don't think he knew that. And another thing he found out was he put a lot of Calvinists in charge that were preaching things that weren't true. So, you know, you start something, it could start out right, but it always ends up in apostasy. And then his son took over, and his son took over, and they believe what we have written here. That okay. only those original autographs are inspired. Well, that's great. Then where are they? They've decayed over the years, and no one has one. But if, if that is true, okay, if that's true, these funny mentalists believe only original autographs are inspired by the hands of God who wrote them, then that means Scripture is only the original writings by the hands of the people that wrote it. And if that's true, we have a very, very wild story according to the Bible. Now, I'm not going to look up these verses. I'm going to comment on each one. But if you go through and you look up the word Scripture in the Bible, which they say is only the original autographs, look at the story we end up with. Jesus is in the temple, and he asked them in Matthew 21, 42, if they've read the Scriptures. So they must have had the original autographs that are thousands of years old in that temple. Well, that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous, but we have to believe that if we want to be funny mentalists like they are. And then in Luke, Jesus read from the scriptures. So he must have been very careful. He probably put those white gloves on, you know, since they were so old and everything. And he must have read from the original autographs. And then in John 5, 39, Jesus commands us to read the scriptures. <coughs> so what does that mean? That means I guess we have to go to the temple. We can only read them in the temple because we can't read them at home because they're only the original autographs. Then in Acts 8.38, the Ethiopian eunuch had the scriptures. So that little black guy, he was a thief. 
<laughs> and went to Jerusalem, he stole the original autographs, if we go according to what they say scriptures are. And then, in Acts 17, 2, Paul had the scriptures to reason with. Where did Paul get them from? Well, I wonder if Paul didn't go to Arabia, and that's why he went to Arabia, because afterwards he went down to Ethiopia and, and stole them back. I mean, does that make sense? Well, we've got, we got to figure it out if we're going by what they teach. In Acts 17, 11, those of Berea searched the scriptures daily, so... I guess Paul donated them to the Berean church. And he had those original autographs in his hand. In Acts 18, 24 through 28, Apollo had the scriptures. So Apollo must have gone to Berea. He must have like been some kind of a thief or something and snuck in, you know, like Mission Impossible, and stole the original autographs, and he was going around using them. And then in 2 Timothy 3.15, Timothy learned from the scriptures. <coughs> so somehow Timothy's mom must have gotten a hold of these original, maybe a garage sale, I don't know. And, and got a hold of them so that Timothy... Isn't it ridiculous what they teach in Bible schools? <laughs> I was blessed to go to Bible school that didn't teach that. They were against the grain in, here in Pensacola. So, inspiration. What is inspiration? Well, it must apply to copies. It won't work what they say, that it's only original autographs. So when the Bible speaks of Scripture, it speaks of the original autographs as well as faithful copies of them. And that's the key, faithful copies of them. Does that make sense? Is everybody with me so far? Don't believe the modern day funny mentalists because how could they believe that? It won't work. It doesn't even make sense. And that was the job of the scribes was to copy the scriptures. Exactly. That, and was, the their scribes. Whole, that was their whole And that's what they were. The you said it. copy the scriptures. You said it. They were scriptures because copies of the original that were faithful are scriptures. That so how could job. they say that they're just the original autographs? That's silly. That's just silly. So Back up to the very top, it says, and, and not any particular translation or translations of them whatsoever. So modern scholars and, and uh, funny mentalists, I hate to call them anything else because they really are a little crazy in the head, they don't believe that a translation can be perfect. Well, if the translation is from the original source, couldn't it be good? could it be right? Well, they don't believe so. Well, what does the Bible say about translation? Oddly enough, the word translate or translated shows up three times in the Bible. And everything, some, every time something's translated, it ends up better than it was before. I heard a guy preach a sermon about that. We're not going to look at those verses. I'm just throwing them in there. But isn't that something when, when you say, what does the Bible say about translation? You look up translate, every time it shows up in the Bible, something changes from not so good to better every time. So it's almost like a translation makes it better. Well, do you guys read Greek? <laughs> no, but we've got the King James. It's better because we can read it. We can't read that. So, even though it's been translated, it's from the faithful copies, it's from the original source, yes, the translation can be perfect. It can be the Word of God. We can call it Scripture. So we can call the King James Bible Scripture, but these people at Bob Jones and other Bible schools, they can't. So they just say it's a reliable translation. That's what they call the King James. And yet they don't believe it. So, doctrine of preservation, all right? Then we have inspiration. If God inspired it, great. But then he lost it. I don't think so. He must have uh, preserved it. Where did he preserve it? Let's look at a couple verses real quick. Go to Psalms 12, 6 and 7. Psalms 12, 6 and 7. It might go faster if somebody will look up each verse and uh, have one. So, Jim, would you go to Psalms 119.89? And Brother Darby, would you do Psalms 119.9? And then, uh, Brother Dave, would you do Psalms 138, verse 2? So, I'll go ahead and read Psalms 12, 6 and 7. <clears throat> And here's a great verse that talks about preservation. If God was strong enough to inspire His Word, then He must be powerful enough to preserve it. And in Psalms 12, 6 and 7, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, and silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So I believe God preserved His words in the King James Bible. Now what does Psalms 1, 19, 89 say? It says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So God has his word that he gave to us, and he settled it, and it's settled up there. You say, well, that's up there. What about down here? <laughs> well, down here as well, because he's the one that spoke it down here, and we have it. It's preserved. Psalm 119, verse 9. Nor with all shall a young man cleanse his way, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Okay, so the only way we can cleanse our ways is taking heed unto the word. Well, how can we do that if we don't have the word? If you follow modern teaching of fundamentalist scholars, it's the original autographs, we don't have it. So then we can't do it. So we might as well go fishing or go bowling or do something because we can't find God's Word and we can't read it. What's verse 11 say there, Brother Darby? 
says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. How can we hide it in our heart if we don't have it? Modern Christianity today preaches you don't have the Bible because the scriptures is only the original autographs and we don't have them. So either they're lying or the Bible's true and God did preserve them so that we can hide them in our heart. Uh, what does Psalm 138 and verse 2 say, Brother Dave? And this is so important. I will worship for the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Did you get that? God said he loves his word and it's so powerful and so important. He says he's magnified this above his very name. Romans 14.11 says that the name of God every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. But this is higher than his name. That's how important the word is. If it's that important, then don't you think God would give it to us? <laughs> yeah, it stinks if it was that important. Then God goes, well, I lost it. Okay, well then, let's just go fishing and forget about it. So the doctrine of preservation goes hand in hand with inspiration. If God only inspired his words and then lost it, so what? It's not a very smart God, is it? He must have inspired it and then preserved it for us today. So where is God's word translated in English for, for us today? There's only one. It's the King James Bible, also or otherwise known as the King, KJV 1611. Some people call it the KJB, King James Bible. Well, either way, KJV is King James Version. Now look at it, Ecclesiastes 8.1. What does the Bible say about the word of a king? <laughs> this is interesting. There's no other version that calls itself a king's version except the new King James, which we will look at a little later. It's full of errors. But Ecclesiastes 8.4. Somebody got that? They could read it real quick. Where the word of the king is their power. And... Yeah, where the word of the king is, there is power. Sorry. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Interesting. Where the word of the king is, there is power. Well, we have the word of a king. Now, this isn't King James' words. But God chose a man named King James to give us his word. And he authorized the translation. And what's interesting, during that time period was probably one of the greatest um, time periods of learning after the Reformation. And the people that translated the King James Bible, many of them spoke 12 to 13 different languages. And they had all the text on the table that we have today. And God used those men to go through and look at all those texts and arrive at the right one for what we have today. We're going to look at that in a little bit called collation. Go ahead, Brother Jim. Well, I mean, they talk about King James and they try to miss, you know, miss, they say that King James was a homosexual. Right. And so they try to disallow the uh, uh, that was started by the Catholics. Yeah. The Catholics hate the King James Bible. Yeah. So they've propagated the lie that King James was a homosexual. Right. There's a good book called King James Unjustly Accused. You can buy that online or somewhere. Forget the author's name. But he shows the facts that King James was not a homosexual. He was born with an enlarged tongue. And because he was a, a king, most of the time they would inbreed. And that would lead to de defects in the body. And he had an enlarged tongue. And so when he talked, he talked like that. And people thought, oh, he's a homo. And he was very an affectionate person. He had some men close to him that he loved, and he'd hug them, and he'd kiss them, and he'd say, man, I love you. But if you read his other writings, he was, a, he was a devout Christian. He loved the Lord. And so I do not believe that that man was a homosexual. That book shows a lot of proof against that. So, of course, you're going to see people going against King James and trying to, to label him a homosexual, which is what they've tried to do. So... What about it? The King James is the only Bible we have that's called an authorized version. No other version can take that claim. Yet today there are over 200 different English Bibles and they change the Word of God. They don't read alike and they often leave out whole verses. Why? What does the King James itself say about this? There's three different times in the Bible when we're warned against changing the Word of God. Let's look at these three. Deuteronomy chapter 4. And if you don't know these, these are so important to remember. Because it's not right to change the Word of God. Matter of fact, there's some curses that God will put on you if you try to mess with His Word. And, and think about it like this. What is the Bible? Some, somebody said it's the love letter of God to us. You know, and before we got married, Laura and I would write letters back to each other. And, and because we loved each other, they're love letters. Now, I would be so mad if someone intercepted those and started scribbling stuff out and then sent it to me. I'd be like, what'd she say? What'd she say? Well, why don't people feel like that about the Bible? Why do they say, no, here, take the Bible and give it to me later and translate it differently? And, and cut a whole bunch of verses out. That's fine. Somebody doesn't love God. You know? God loved us enough to get us His pure word. Amen? 
So what does it say in Deuteronomy 4.2? Here we read, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Command number one, do not add or remove from the, king, from the Bible. Now we go to Proverbs chapter 30, and verse 5. There was actually a debate about this um, with a guy named Sam Giff, and it was on that John Ankerberg show. I don't know if you all heard that story. They were debating why the King James, and one of the men who, who did one of these new versions, he couldn't even speak. He was going to say something, and God took his speech from him. <laughs> and he couldn't even speak. And he was like weeks, or was it years, that he couldn't talk. And he has since recanted and said, you know, I studied it over again. The King James Bible, King James Bible's right. That's pretty amazing. It happened back in the 90s. That was a living Bible, wasn't it? That might have been the living by Lou. That was awful. Yeah, that was he, awesome. he knew he made a mistake. He sure did. Yeah, he knew it. So uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. It says, Every word of God is pure, and he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So if you try to change God's word, what does that make you? A liar. And that's what the new Bibles are. They're liars. And we will see later that there are lies in new versions of the Bible. Because they changed them, they actually made the text read as a lie rather than truth. Well, the Bible says the word is truth. Now, Revelation 22, 18 and 19, very close to the very end of the Bible. So we see beginning, middle, and end of the Bible tells us don't mess with God's word. In Revelation 22, 18, is it? Yeah. 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, so God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Pretty damning testimony. I don't want to mess with God's word. I don't want any plagues on me or anything like that. It's a serious thing to change the word of God, but somebody has done so. Who? The apostates in the end times when the Bible was written as well as today. So they're messing with it today, but yet back when it was written, they were messing with it. Let's look at two verses on that that Paul tells us. Paul says that even in his time, in his day, people were messing with the Bible. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. And what we're going to get to is there are two lines of Bible text. One is the pure text, and one is the corrupted, messed with text. So which line does the King James come from? The right side. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 17. For we are not as many, look at that, many, which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. He said there were many people in his time period when he lived, about 60 AD or whenever, that were corrupting the word of God. So there were many corrupt texts in the time of Paul. Now look at chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. That's the reason why people say we can't have God's word today because we don't know which one is the good or which one's bad. Yes, we can know, and we're going to look at that. But look at um, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God, how? Deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So someone corrupted the word, and someone was handling it, handling it deceitfully. And so someone has changed the Bible. Can we find those bad, perverted texts? Can we even find out who they were and where they came from? As a matter of fact, we can. And that brings us to our next point. Well, let me go ahead and read this. So why so many different English translations? In Spanish, there's only one translation of Shakespeare from English to Spanish. <laughs> why does there have to be 200 different translations of the King James, of the Bible into English? How come there's just not one? Money. Huh? Money. Money, yeah. By the way, these two verses we read about people changing, you look at these verses in new versions of the Bible, and you can tell it pricks their conscience when they read it. And they change it so much you can't even recognize these two verses. So you can't prove in new versions of the Bible that there are people corrupting it. Uh, one of them says that peddle the word of God or something like that. I mean, they change it. It's just ridiculous. So the topography of where Bibles come from, number four. I give you all a book called The Tale of Three Cities by David Reagan. And this is a guy that gave me permission. I asked him, can I start printing your book? He said, yeah, so I can print this up. And it talks about three different cities, and it's good to show us about where the text came from for the King James and where the text came from for the wrong versions. And it really, though, should be called The Tale of Four Cities because he left one out. 
And if we want to look at the tale of three cities or whatever, <coughs> look at where the Bible came from, we need to see four different cities. There's one is Rome and one is Alexandria. And one is Antioch and one is Jerusalem. And from Antioch is where we get the New Testament. And we're going to look at this. And the pure Old Testament comes from Jerusalem. Well, the Old Testament of the corrupt text is from Alexandria. And we see the New Testament, well, New Testament also, but we see a connection with Rome. So on the right side of the map, we see the right text, the right line of text. See the line there? And on the left side of the map, why is it the left is always wrong? Isn't that weird? <laughs> on the left side of the map, we see a line of text that are the corrupt text. So you want the pure text, stay on the right. This is the, where the line of the pure text came from. So you've got two different lines of Bible text, and look at who they're connected with, Rome. We're going to see that nothing good ever came out of Rome. So, the tale of two cities, so we see four different cities there, Antioch and Jerusalem. So, what does the Bible say about these cities and countries? The pure text, where do they come from? First, we find that the pure text come from Jerusalem, the Old Testament. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, and the Bible itself tells us exactly where to look for the pure Old Testament text. Because in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? It's as much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now what are the oracles of God? Well, the oracles, is what I'm talking about, is the Bible. God gave the Bible to Jew. Every writer of the Bible was a Jew. Did you know that? Well, today they try to write books and say, well, Luke was a Gentile. Ah, I think every writer of the Bible is a Jew because it says the oracles of God were given to the Jews. So it's interesting that God gave the Jews the Bible. So if we want to find the pure Old Testament in Hebrew, should we go over to Alexandria, to Egypt? Or should we go to Jerusalem? That's the fountain. That's the source, right? So that's the place to go. Now how about the New Testament? Where should we go for the New Testament? We'll go to Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. And we see that after Jesus, when they went around preaching... They eventually ended up in Antioch. You know, Jim, last week you mentioned something. You said Peter never left Jerusalem. And I thought, um, Jim, <laughs> he went to Antioch, and at the end of his ministry, he was in Babylon. So Peter did travel out, around a little bit, just, just so you know. But um, it says, and I'm just going to read the end of the verse, uh, Acts 11:26, And taught much people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in those days came prophets from Jerusalem. So we see a connection between Antioch and Jerusalem. And Antioch and Jerusalem. So these people down here after Jesus were going up here. And so if we want a New Testament, where's the New Testament? Where would we look for for the New Testament? Well, they spoke Greek in that time. So this is where the right text would come from. Antioch of Syria, where the early uh, Christians were. Or the disciples of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay. So why would... Anyone try to say, no, that's not true, we need to go over here. All scholars tell you, this is where you go to get the right text. When the Bible tells you, this is where you go. <laughs> Why? Why would they, do they read the Bible even? I mean, do they even understand it? So the corrupted text, what are the corrupted texts? Where do they come from? Most modern Bible scholars, Bible schools, fundamentalists, and Christians today believe that the Bible was not preserved through those areas where the Bible says the Jews and Christians were, but from a different fountain. They claim that God preserved his word through Alexandria, Egypt, and through Rome, Italy. But why would he? Why would God do that? The Bible has nothing good to say about the geographical area known as Egypt, and nothing good to say about Alexandria, and absolutely nothing good to say about Rome, Italy. Egypt is a type of the world in Scripture. And the Bible says nothing good about Egypt. I'm not going to read the verses, but just comment on this real quick. Egypt, first time is mentioned in the Bible, is connection with Abraham not trusting Egyptians around his wife. <laughs> There's a little bit of a sexual sin going on in that place, and he was afraid to take his wife there. Uh, Isaac is told not to go to Egypt. Joseph, one of the greatest types in, of Christ in the Bible, was sold into Egypt as a slave. Egypt is a type of the world. Joseph said, do not leave my bones in Egypt. Israel was enslaved in Egypt, and Egypt was called the house of bondage. I believe it was 400 years they were slaves in Egypt. The kings of Israel were forbidden to get horses from Egypt. Jews were forbidden to go to Egypt. God calls his son out of Egypt. And then the last one, Egypt is placed in the same category as Sodom in the book of Revelation. And I, I forgot to mention one, but God told the Jews, if you do such and such, I'll give you the plagues of Egypt. 
And I thought about it, and I'm like, I bet you that's where all the STDs came from. That's what he's talking about. Because uh, Egypt's a bunch of um, Hamites, and the first mention was, watch your wife around them. So, you know, I could have said a couple other things, but I'll stop there, you know. Uh, but, so Egypt's not a good place. So why would we go to Egypt for the Bible? Doesn't make sense. Well, Egypt and Alexandria are connected in the Bible. And the first time Alexandria is mentioned, it's connected with unbelievers, persecution, and eventually the death of Stephen. The next mention of Alexandria is of a preacher who had to been set straight on his doctrine. He came out of Alexandria and he was preaching wrong. He was taught wrong, and they had to straighten him out. The last two times Alexandria is mentioned in the Bible, it's talking about Paul taking a ship from Alexandria to Rome, and Paul's actually killed in Rome eventually. So, yeah, yeah, good mention there, right? Yeah, let's go to Alexandria for, no, I don't think so. What about Rome? Well, it was Rome who killed Jesus Christ. Rome killed James. Rome put Peter and Paul in jail. Rome is not a good place. They say that there's no crueler um, ruler and empire in the world than the Roman Empire. They were the most cruel, evil people in the world. It's just a sad, sad thing. So how could anyone with half a brain think that God would use these places on the left to give us his word, especially when they're never mentioned in good light. But every Bible scholar today believes that. Oh, no, that's where the good text comes from. It doesn't make sense. Even a child can see through that, right? So, two different distinct lines of thought. And right now, let's look at the teachings about the Bible from these two cities. We're going to look at Alexandria, and we're going to look at Antioch. Because after Jesus, a couple hundred years, there arose a school in Antioch that said, We're Christians. And then over here in Alexandria, there rose a school that says, no, we're Christians. And they would fight each other, and they claimed to be Christians. But these had the right Bible, and these started to pervert and change the Bible. Now, I could not find this information in English, so I got my Spanish encyclopedia, and I tried to translate. <laughs> so what I'm reading to you here has been translated from Spanish. <clears throat> and in this encyclopedia in Spanish, it says, there was the Antioch... Antiochian school of thought about the Bible. What did they believe in Antioch? What did the Bible schools teach in Antioch a couple hundred years after Jesus? Well, it says the Christian school of catechesis. Now, is that right, Darby? Because I don't know how to translate that into English or Spanish. Is that a word in English, catechesis? Cate catechesis is teaching, basically. So the Christian school of teaching. Is that right? That's teaching. Is situated, it says, completely opposite that, opposite that of Alexandria. So what it's going to tell us is what they taught in Antioch is the exact opposite of what they taught in Alexandria. The school followed the school of uh, thought <coughs> exclusively <coughs> of grammatical exegesis and historical teaching of the sacred text, without any concessions to allegory or symbolism, <coughs> to the contrary of their counterparts in Alexandria. Twice, we're told, they were completely opposite of what they taught in Alexandria. And it says, which they maintained a critical rivalry. The two most illustrious disciples were Theodore of somewhere and John Christostom, I guess is how you translate the English. I didn't have time to look them up, make sure I translate them correctly. But <clears throat> the first held a point of view more liberal, while John considered the word of God infallible in every part. Well, that's what I believe. The King James is infallible. He not only attributed the great importance of the liberal, literal meaning of the Bible, but he constantly repudiated, repudiated the allegorical method of interpretation yeah. practiced by his Alexandrian, and then it says brethren. And I don't think I could call them brethren yeah. when we find out what they taught in Alexandria. <clears throat> now, what did they believe down in Alexandria, Egypt? Go ahead. I was going to say, you know, kind of filtered out what that really means. I, what they would do is they'd take the Word of God and just add a whole bunch of junk into it. Exactly. And um, because that's what they call biblical exegesis. When I went to Bible college, that's what they did. They actually taught you to pervert the Word of God and uh, put your own, matter of fact, put it into your own words and right. just expound on it. Yeah. And matter of fact, I just got through reading a book that did exactly that. Yep. And uh, it was just really, really sad that it ends up twisting the Word of God. So that right. whole school was a complete. Perversion. And it goes back to allegorical exegesis. Allegorical what we're about to read. It's, where, the Bible's not true. It's That's an right. allegory. So you can take what you want out of it and make story. it say Make whatever you want to say. <clears throat> right. So number two, the Alexandrian School of Thought. Thanks, Brother Darby. This Christian school was founded by Panteus and run by Clement and then Origen and then Dionysus. And they've got the dates of when they lived. In contact with the, listen to this, Platonic tradition and the thought of Philo, the Alexandrian school developed a totally allegorical exegesis of the Bible. In Alexandria, Christianity tried to reconcile Christian doctrine with Greek philosophy. 
Now, wait a minute. What does the Bible say about philosophy? Now, we're, we've got to go quickly, so I'm going to skip this one, but we'll read the next one. But it says, don't let philosophy spoil you. Colossians 2.8 tells us to watch out for philosophy because it can spoil you. Well, if you look at this, this Alexandrian school of thought, you find something very interesting. This guy, Origen, studied under a guy named Clement, who studied under Philo. Philo studied under Aristotle, who studied under Plato, who studied under Socrates. So you see Greek philosophy starting with Socrates and aligned straight down to the people that corrupted the Word of God. Should we take a Bible that's been changed based on what someone thinks it should say in their allegorical thinking in Greek philosophy or not? Now this is what's so sad. If you look at that guy Socrates, you find an evil, evil, evil person. Socrates, if you look at his life, he was all he did was go around and ask questions. If I had lived back then, I think I would have punched him in the face. Because all Socrates went around doing was go, well, what about that? Well, what do you think about that? Well, tell me about that. What do you think of that? His whole life, he questioned things. He never taught anything one time. So what do you think about And how about that? I mean, what do you do with the person like that? You just want to punch him, you know? <laughs> all he knew how to do is, well, he was going to be put in jail and executed for corrupting the youth. They actually voted and said, this guy is corrupting the youth because all he does is go around and ask questions. He never taught anything. Yet that's what Greek philosophy is founded on. You know what? That's what Satan did, didn't he? In Genesis chapter 3, and verse 1, what is the first thing the devil does when he shows up? He starts questioning things. So he said, yeah, have God said. All right, we don't have to look at it. You know what it says. Yeah, have God said. So this guy, Socrates, was a queer child molester who set up his own school of thought and killed himself after sacrificing to the snake god, and that's how you spell, I say it, escapulous. I looked it up. And you know what the snake god is? Is He's the same thing you see that on doctors have, that, that pole with two snakes around it. So who is that? That's a type of Satan. <laughs> so he was a Satanist. He was following Satan, going around questioning everything, and that was the basis of the school of thought that tried to give us this Bible that all Bibles today are based on, except the King James. The King James is based on this. Are you seeing the picture? Are you seeing where we're coming from? Stay away from new versions of the Bible. So which school of thought do you want? Well, let's look at old Bob Jones again, the bastion of orthodoxy that claims to be the most fundamental Bible school in the world. And look what they say, I quote, Today there are two Greek texts available. One is the received text, often called the Byzantine or majority text. That's the right side. The other is the Greek Testament edited by Westcott and Ward in the 19th century and based upon the manuscripts of the 4th century called the Alexandrian text. Okay, the text from Alexandria. Yeah, that's the bad one, right? The King James was based on the received text. The American Standard Version was based upon the text of Westcott and Ward. It is our conviction that these Alexandrian manuscripts are, as a rule, the more accurate manuscripts to follow. What? <laughs> It says, therefore, along with the great majority of conservative scholars, I don't care, the majority is usually wrong, aren't they? We believe that the text of Westcott and Hort, based upon these Alexandrian manuscripts, is as a whole superior to the text based upon the manuscripts of the Middle Ages. Wow. Can you believe that? Would you send your kids to a school that taught that? Not me. Did God give his words to the Jews and Christians where they actually started? Or did he give it to the Greeks who changed it and interpreted it allegorically according to their pagan philosophy? I think the answer itself is evident. God did not use Greek philosophers to give us his word. Amen? So the two line of Bible texts. As we've seen, there are very, two very different lines of Bible texts. One is God's line, the other is Satan's. One comes from the fountain of, of people in Israel and the early uh, Christians, while the other is a perverted Bible that has been influenced by Greek philosophy and allegorical teaching. Now let's look at the text themselves, and the best way to do this is look at both the Old and New Testament. And what I'm going to do, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, <laughs> is this is a, an interesting way to teach it. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, and because I'm running out of time, we're going to skip that, but it says, desire the, the pure milk of the Word. The Bible says the Word of God is like milk. Matter of fact, there's many things the Word of God is like. Honey and bread and other different kind of foods. There's seven different foods that the Bible's like. But it's like milk. Where does milk come from? Moose. Huh? Cow. Well, cow, but mother's milk. Well, it comes from the breasts, right? 
Okay. I'm trying not to be offensive, uh, but Dave, I know those hearty commercials bother you. Um, I hope this doesn't bother you. I'm not going to put any nipples up here, okay? So I don't want to offend anybody. But think about it like this. A mother has two sides, and so we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. So to look for where the pure texts come from, let's just pretend we have a pure mother, and here are her two paps. That's a word the Bible uses, so we use that. And over here we have the corrupt text, and it's connected with what? Rome. And Rome, if you read Revelation, is called the mother of harlots and abominations. So here's a whore giving her milk. This is a whore's milk. <laughs> Would you take your baby and give it to a whore and say, go ahead and nurse her for me? I don't think so. Who knows what she's got? She's probably got the plagues of Egypt. So as we look at the Bible, let's, let's think about that and let's take it like this. Now, does that offend you? If it does, I'll erase it. But uh, this is one of the ways I heard it taught in Spanish, and I thought, oh, pretty good, because you can really point out. Look at the whore and her two different fountains that she gives out milk from. And then look at the pure word of God and the two fountains the milk comes from. Are you with me? So what we have is we study out the different texts. We find that the Old Testament from Jerusalem is Hebrew, which is so awful because the new versions try to say, no, it's Greek. And we've got to go to Greek. Well, that's a translation. I thought these, these uh, fundamentalists said no translation's any good. So why wouldn't they go to the Hebrew in the Old Testament? No, they always translate from the Greek. So the Hebrew, and which text is it? The Hebrew Masoretic text. <clears throat> All right, what is the New Testament pure Bible from? It's called the Texas Receptus. And that is actually uh, a Greek Texas Receptus. Really, what that means is majority text or the received text. And why is it called the received text? Well, because true Christians have received it. And we'll look at that. So what are the corrupt texts? Well, over here you have a Greek LXX, which is also called a Septuagint. Almost sounds like a septic tank, doesn't it? The received text is because it was received from God. That's right. another way to look at it. Right, as well. But it also it has the most witnesses, too. There's over 5,000 different texts. So over here we have the Latin Vulgate, which is another corrupt Old Testament. Almost sounds like vulgar, doesn't it? And then we have a Nazi text by a man named Kittle. And he, believe it or not, was connected with the Nazis. So did God use Germans to give us his Old Testament? <laughs> I don't think so. All right, so over here in the New Testament, what do we have? From the whore's milk. We have the Vat, the Canis, and Sinaiticus. And you know what? I abbreviated them. And what do we have? Sin and vat. Now that's where you go to get wine. And what does the Bible say about the great whore? She's drunk on the wine of the blood of the saints. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, it's all there if you just open your eyes, you know. So we have Westcott and Hort. And I'll just abbreviate them. We have Nessel Island. And the Nessel Island is a, is a new corrupt Greek text. And it's also known as the GNT3. These are the same thing. So quickly, and I'm trying to hurry, we've got at least another 30 minutes, so we're doing really good. I think we can get through this. All right, so as we've seen, there's two very different lines of Bible text. One is God's line, the other is the devil's. So look at the pure text first. Let's look at the pure text in the Old Testament. According to the Bible, the Levitical priests were to copy and preserve the Word of God. And since we're a little short on time, um, we'll, we'll forgo reading these verses, but I'll just comment on them. In Deuteronomy 17, 18, the king was told to copy the law. So when you became a king of Israel, you were supposed to write down by hand every bit of the Old Testament law. And where were you to get it from? From the Levitical priests. In Deuteronomy 31, 26 through 20, uh, 24 through 26, Moses gave the law when he wrote it to the Levitical priests. So the Levitical priests were to copy, as Ms. Darby said, the, um, they were the, the ones that were scribes that copied it. And Ezra was a scribe. And so in Ezra we read that he had the text. So these... These Jews, there was a tribe of Israel that was devoted completely to copying the Word of God over and over and over. The Masoretic text was the Old Testament preserved by the Jews today, known as the Hebrew Masoretic text. They were called Masorites or Masoretes. They were Jewish Levitical priests. They copied the scriptures, and they had rules in copying the Bible. So strict they were that when they copied one page of the Old Testament, if there were more than two mistakes, it had to be burned and they had to write it over. That's pretty strict law, isn't it, for copying the Bible? After they finished, they had to read it forward and backward, 
And they knew in their head exactly how many letters and words there was in each page that they copied. So they would make sure and check and double check and triple check. They were so reverent that every time they came to the name of the Word of God, they stopped and went and washed their hands. And then came back so that they would write it down with clean hands because they loved God. I'm getting chill bumps just thinking, how could you go to this other line of text when people had these rules and they really loved God and they were making sure to copy it right? So where, um, where is the Hebrew Masoretic text? It's still preserved today in the printing by a man named Baumberg in about the 1400s. It's called the Ben Chaim text today, and you can get a hold of it. Here is the Hebrew Old Testament Masoretic text. It's right there. So you can get it if you want it. <laughs> if you, I, don't, I learned Hebrew, and I forgot it as quickly as possible because it looks like chicken scratch, you know? <laughs> I've got a King James, so I don't need it, amen? So what is the Textus Receptus? What is this right here, the pure text over on this side? The New Testament was written in Koine Greek. That means the Greek of the everyday common man. And these Greek texts, uh, early Greek texts, which came out of Syria, okay, where Antioch is, which, by the way, was later the Byzantine Empire. So the majority text, where the King James came from, the Textus Receptus, is often referred to as the Byzantine text all, as well. Because all these texts were found in this area in Greek that lined up with the right text. And the Textus Receptus was over 5,000 309, uh, 309 surviving Greek manuscripts, which were copies of copies of copies of the original. I have a question on that. That doesn't mean they were complete. Right, because we're going to see they had some problems in them. Yeah. And what we're going to see is the miracle how God could still give us his pure word, even though those had mistakes in them. But as we see here, even though they didn't read exactly alike, they matched each other 95% of the time. So they agreed together, these 5,000 texts, 95% of the time. Now you look at the corrupt text, they're 5% of all the texts that have ever been found. And they disagree over 3,000 times just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it's kind of a no-brainer <laughs> which one to go to. You go to the Texas Receptus. So these um, Texas Receptus is where we find the, the pure Greek text from the right line. There was also a Syria, Syriac text because the Texas Receptus, people say, well, that only goes back, you know, uh, so many years. Is there something closer? There was an old Syriac text, which was about 100 to 200 years after Jesus. And since the early Christians were from Antioch of Syria, they translated from Greek into Syriac. And you know what? No Bible school today teaches Syriac. I wonder why. Because if they did and read that text, they'd say, oh, it reads like the King James. <laughs> so, hey, let's just completely forget that. And that's the oldest uh, line of text is back then. So, the KJV... When they had all these manuscripts on the table, they even had the Alexandrian manuscripts. And they looked at them and said, man, that's got a lot of errors. We're going to use these. And they knew which ones to use. Now, the corrupted text. The Septuagint or the LXX. Over here, we're going to start on this line from the tainted milk, so to speak. There are several corrupt Old Testaments that people use today in making their new translations of the Bible. First is the Septuagint or the LXX, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. A story has been invented, and I say invented because there's no facts to prove that this story is real. And how this text was made. According to this made-up story, King Ptolemy II of Egypt, around 250 B.C., asked six Jews from each tribe of Israel to come to Alexandria and translate the Old Testament into Greek. Does that sound right to you? We saw that only the Levites were the ones that copied the Bible. So why would you have... All 12 tribes, six people from all 12 tribes coming over to this place to translate the Bible into Greek. Doesn't even sound right, does it? And guess what? Two of them didn't show up. So there were only 70 that supposedly showed up. So 70, Roman numerals, LXX. That's why they call it the LXX. It should be the LXX2, or LXXII or something. So they don't even have the number right. But this could not have happened. First, only the tribe of Levi was given the word of God. So why would other tribes go to do that? It would be against the Bible. Second, the story says they actually did the translation. But as we've seen, the Old Testament prohibits them to go to Egypt. So why would they go to Egypt against the Bible to do that? Why would they disobey the scriptures? There's no evidence this ever happened. And the LXX is riddled with errors, omissions, additions, and mistakes. So even if they did it, and they could keep their Old Testament true, why would they do it and then make mistakes in Greek? It just it doesn't, it doesn't work. So if you study this out, you find out that the guy that most likely did the LXX was a guy named Origen. And we've already looked at him. 
He was one of those from the school of Alexandria. And he was a very messed up individual. He had a work that he called the Hexapla. And he had six different Greek texts. And each one was translated by somebody else. And his was the fifth column. And that's where it looks like the LXX came from. You know what he did? He castrated himself after reading the verse, If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. He had a problem with lustful thoughts, so he cut off his male member. So he also castrated the Bible as he corrupted it in many places by perverting it. So, obviously, he did not rightly divide the word of truth, pun intended. <laughs> he did not understand the Bible. And so he divided something, he cut something off he shouldn't have because he didn't realize that's not for us today. So, would you follow this guy? Modern scholars praise this guy, Origen. But if you start reading some of the things that he wrote, he didn't believe hell was a literal place. Uh, he believed in purgatory, though. But then he said, but everybody in purgatory one day will get out. I mean, you just look at some of the things the guy wrote, you can just tell he's insane. He's probably not even saved. Very Roman Catholic. So next we have the Latin Vulgate. What is the Latin Vulgate? Where did it come from? Well, the Latin Vulgate is the Latin text that came about 400 years after Jesus. And... Um, and let me go ahead and read it here. It didn't take long for the early church to become apostate. And when it did, those apostate teachings were readily accepted by Rome when the Catholic Church was officially begun in 325 A.D. with Constancy. The new corrupt church wanted an official Bible, so they used a man named Jerome about 400 years after Jesus to produce an entire Latin Bible translation, the official language of Rome. What he produced is now called the Latin Vulgate. But if you read that and look at that, that version is full of errors and mistakes. This is the Latin Vulgate. If you read Latin and you want to you want to see if I'm telling you the truth or not, here it is. And uh, yeah, good luck. Have fun. But that's it right there. And so what is that version? Well, he even admitted, Jerome himself that did the translation, he even admitted that he made many changes. And that if people knew that, they'd call him a heretic on the changes that he made. Casiodoro de Reina, who in 1569 translated the whole Bible into Spanish, said these words about that Roman Catholic Bible. Now listen, this is the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church to today. They say only you can read this Bible in Latin. You're not allowed to read any other version. Unless we officially say it's okay to read a translation made from the Vulgate. Look what uh, this guy who left the Catholic Church says. First, we declare that we have not followed completely or in all the old Latin translation, the Vulgate, that is in common use. For although its ancient authority is mighty, neither one or the other should excuse the many errors that it has, departing so many innumerable times from the truth of the Hebrew Old Text. Others adding, others transposing from one place to another, all of which, though could well be prevented, it cannot be denied. He says this Latin Vulgate is so full of errors, you can't deny it. So should we have a Bible like that? Go ahead. Am I wrong in saying this, but it seemed to me like there was a Latin Vulgate that was on the other side. Okay. They copied. The Latin Vulgate was about 400 after Jesus. That's now right. about 200 years that's after that's Jesus, that's right. that's what we Latin know Vulgate. today is the Waldenses, yeah. right. they that's translated right. into Latin, Latin, a pure Latin text. So there is a pure Latin text, and it's 200 years uh, younger, I guess, or what's the word, 200 years older right. than, than this Latin actually, Vulgate. Actually, what they did is they copied that one and perverted it. Well, also, they, they might have looked at that, Jerome, but he also, he went to origin heavily. And so he went to Alexandria yeah. and other places when he did his Latin yeah. Vulgate. Yeah. So he might have looked at that as well, but he made many changes. That's what we're getting at. Yeah, I got you. And his version became the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church, when you make a translation today in any language, they say it's got to come from the Vulgate. And then if it does, we'll put our papal stamp of a seal on it. And I've got Spanish Bibles that have the papal seal that say this is condoned by the Catholic Church to read because it comes from the Vulgate. So, the Vulgate is not God's preserved word. Even the man who did it confessed that it has errors. The next one we look at is this one, the Kittel. And a German scholar named Rudolf Kittel made his own Hebrew text known today as Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Sense. And that one's this one here. And I wrote on all of them corrupt, but also put a little Nazi symbol because this guy, he... He worked with the Nazis. Hmm, interesting. So Kittle, what he did is he found uh, an Old Testament in Hebrew from about 1000 A.D. And he found it in Leningrad, Russia. 
And he, he claimed this is the oldest existing manuscript in Hebrew, so we got to get a translation from it. But he was a German. Um, would God preserve his word through the Nazis that killed the Jews? That just doesn't make sense, does it? And yet, all new versions of the Bible, the Old Testament, is based on that Nazi text. So, that makes sense, does it? Well, what does it say in the very beginning in the preface of that Bible? It says these words, The large Masorah has been printed separately and is a welcome sign of the times, yeah, if you're living in apostasy, that was published jointly in 1975 by the Württemberg Bible Society, Stuttgart, and the Pontifical Bible Institute of Rome, both as the Masorah, whatever. So, Rome worked together to translate this. So, what do you think they did? They tried to get as much of that Vulgate into it as they could, probably. So, is that a good text? Should we go over to that line? No. So, run into the New Testament. Yeah, there's not that much. We can get through this quickly. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> it's 1209 if this is right. So, I think in about 20 minutes we can get done. How's that? Everybody's okay? Or do you need to take no, a break? No, uh, it's actually 1213. 11. Okay, well, this is 11. Excuse me, 1113. Well, I don't want to pull a Darby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. So, Zebra, I believe we can get through this. So, let's look at these corrupt New Testaments, all right? And this we'll just go through real quick. This is the Vaticanus. The Vaticanus is a Greek manuscript that was found in 1481, and guess where it was found? In the Vatican in Rome. It was sitting in the Pope's library. And it's, it was written on fine vellum, animal skin. It is without a doubt from the Alexandrian line of text. It leaves out Genesis 1, 1 to 46, 28. There's only two chapters of Genesis in it, I guess. No, four chapters. It leaves out Psalms 106 to 138. It leaves out all of Paul's epistles. I wonder why. Um, all of Revelation. It is so full of errors, but it also contains the Apocrypha. Oh, if you're Catholic, you've got to have that Apocrypha. Well, the Sinaiticus, it was found in 1844 by Constantine von Tischendorf in a wastebasket. Did you hear that? It was in the garbage can when he found it. What does that tell you? That even the Catholic priest said, this is no good, let's throw it out. It was in the wastebasket, and this guy found it. It says it, it's all the New Testament, plus Hermes, Shepherd of Hermes, and Epistle of Barnabas. However, it's so bad, it admits 10, 20, 30, 40 verses and words frequently. Leaves out whole letters and sentences. Also, it leaves out completely the last 12 verses of Mark. Now, what modern scholars did is they took these two perversions, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and they made their new Greek text based upon these two manuscripts. There were so many errors in these two manuscripts that they don't even agree with each other over 3,000 times in just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's over 3,000 differences between these two texts. Scholars teach that these are the older and better texts, and they claim they're from about 400 years after Jesus. If you start studying them, it's about 600 years after Jesus. Do we have anything that goes farther back? Of course we do. We've got the old Syriac that's about 100 years after Jesus. We've got copies of copies of copies in Greek that go back to the time of Jesus. So we have something way older than these. So obviously somebody messed with those and changed them and corrupted them. So <clears throat> let's look at what happened. Well, in 1881, these two guys named Westcott and Hork decided, hey, we're going to make our own Greek text because we don't like the King James. And the man's name was John Anthony Hort and Brooke Foss Westcott. And what they did is they got together and produced their new eclectic text. You know what eclectic means? means picking and choosing. So they took two corrupt checks and they picked and choose to make their own text of what they think the Bible should say. That, that should have put a red flag up immediately. All right, so... What was their background? Exactly, we're going to look at yeah. that. And so in 1881, they produced their own text. Now, when that text came out, all right, I don't have the, the, the um, footnote or whatever of this, but I remember reading this. When that text came out in 1881, the first thing they did is they went to the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, and they were so excited. And they said, we want you to accept our Greek New Testament. And what they were hoping is that she would authorize it. Well, then it would be a Queen, <laughs> queen Bible. That would be King James, the Queen Victoria Bible. Well, anyway, they were going to present it to her. And Queen Victoria's um, uh, main preacher, who, you know, I forget what they call those people, he whispered something in Queen Victoria's ear. And then he backed off. And as soon as he did, Queen Victoria looked at Westcott and Hort and went, and walked away, and never talked to them ever again. That is historical fact. So what, I would love to know what he would have said to Queen Victoria that made her say, no, I will not accept that Bible. 
That's amazing. That is, so who knows what it was? But these guys, um, they produced in 1881 their eclectic Greek text. Four years later, someone decided we're going to translate that into English. And that's where the revised version came from of 1884. Now these two men were so evil, so utterly wicked. They were part of the Protestant Anglican Church, but they were closet Roman Catholics and secret atheists. And they would dress up. They had a club that they went together where they dressed up as women. So I guess you could call them queen, queen people or something. But they would go, and one guy would pretend to be the man, so he'd dress up like a man. The other would dress I mean, you talk about sickos, dude. Those guys are sick. And she's written a good book about this. Um, Gail yeah, Replinger has written materials and talks about that. But these guys, they belong to a club. They dress like women. They also started the first paranormal society. If you like watching that TV show where they're always filming and it's in dark and it's kind of green and they're looking for ghosts, that was started by Westcott and Hort, what they're doing, that paranormal society back in the 1800s. They also uh, would practice what they called communion with the saints. They would go into church in the middle of the night, turn off the lights, and sit there and pray and wait until one of the dead saints talked to them. What does that sound like to you? Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there are just so many evil things these men did. And when you look at the quotes of what they say, you see some very, very, very evil men. Hort said hell is not a place. He said hell was only figurative. Obviously they don't believe in the Bible. He said that Jesus Christ's atonement for our sins... He said, certainly nothing can be more unscriptural, unscriptural than Jesus bearing our sins in his death. This is almost a universal heresy. Now, that's in this book. The, can you believe someone? They're not saved. He said, um, oh, one guy says about Hort, I had no idea of the importance of text. Oh, no, this is, uh, this is Hort speaking in one of his letters. I had no idea of the importance of text having read so little Greek. He confesses he didn't know hardly any Greek, yet he makes a Greek New Testament. Um, he says, I've read Darwin, and I love Darwin. He's one of my favorites. Just many things that he said. But here's what a guy said about them. Ralph Yarnall says, As far as I've been able to discover, both men, Westcott and Hort, were liberals and by no means fundamentalists. If at all, they were saved. He said, I don't even know if they were saved. So I'll give you some quotes here of what these men say. Um, first one, he says, I reject the infability of the Holy Scriptures overwhelmingly. Uh, he says, our Bible as well as our faith is a mere compromise. Evangelicals seem to me perverted. Oh, really? And you're dressing up like a woman? <laughs> Sorry. He says, there, and he says, especially on the authority of a Bible, there are differences. Um, he says, the popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Nothing can be more inscriptional than the limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to his death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal Harris. They were Romanists. They believed in the Roman Catholic Church. They also called the Greek Pexus Receptus a vile and villainous text. We could go on and on looking at them. Those men were not saved. But you go to most Bible schools today and they praise West God and Hort, the greatest scholars in the world. Didn't know any Greek and they hated the King James. They were closet Catholics. And what they were doing is trying to get people back to the Catholic Church through a new Bible. Which is what Gail says in her book. Okay, so that's we'll ecumenical. It's ecumenical, that's right. So Dean Burgeon, who was one of the greatest scholars in his day that believed in the King James Bible, says this about their text. The Greek text which they have invented proves to be hopelessly depraved throughout. It was deliberately invented. The underlying Greek is an entirely new thing, is a manufactured article throughout. The new Greek text is utterly inadmissible. Proposing to inquire into the merits of the recent revision of the Bible, we speedily became aware that the underlying Greek had been completely refashioned throughout. It, it was not much so much a new version as it was a Greek New Testament which is full of errors from beginning to end. Shame on those most incompetent men who, finding themselves in an evil hour, occupied themselves with falsifying the inspired Greek text, who will venture to predict the amount of mischief which must follow if the Greek New Text should become used. And guess what? That's the only Greek New Text used in all new versions of the Bible after the King James. And what misfit, mischief we're in. We're in an apostate world where, where people are crucifying Christians. Christians had the ear of the world and people were blushed to cuss. And now they hate Christians because Christians are using false versions of the Bible. Now I could go on, but basically Nestle and Allen took the Westcott and Hort text and made their own version. And all new versions of the Bible today 
is, is the Nestle Island is what they use, which is nothing more than the Hebrew, I mean the, the Greek Texas Receptus. And it has another name, it's called the GNT3, the Greek New Testament 3. And it's been revised and revised and revised many times. And it's just, it's so sad how people can be so deceived into thinking that it's okay to use these texts when they don't want those anymore. And now you can see why they've been taught these are the better ones. But yet, if you look at the facts, you can't help but say, no, no, I don't think so. So I'm going to skip over a little bit and go down to number seven, the trick to finding the original autograph. Since we're short on time, I wanted to say more about those texts. Um, somewhere I had on here. Well, really quickly, let me read right here what this says. If you take this Nestle Allen text and you open it up, let me read to you what it says about itself. It says, in a simple yet brilliant stroke, Nestle, and they call it Nestle Island, but that Nestle is the same family as Nestle chocolate. And so not to, to get chocolate mixed with the corrupt Bible, they had to change the pronunciation so you wouldn't think, oh, Nestle, Nestle chocolate? Oh, yeah, that's the Bible guy. So this is the Nestle text, and the chocolate is Nestle's. And they're German, right? And they're German, I believe. It says, it's, it's based on the text of the work of the great textual critics of the 19th century. Westcott and Hort, those cross-dressers. Yeah, they're so great, aren't they? And it says, uh, it's compared with the editions of Tischendorf, Westcott and Hort, yada, yada, yada. It says, the text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as a basis for new translations and for revisions after their supervision. Now look at what it says on the bottom here. In this right there, it says, it should naturally be understood that this text is a working text it is not to be considered as definitive. <laughs> so is that the final authority? Nope. That's garbage. Found in a garbage, basically. Is that where, what's the name found it? So yeah, I, I'm not going to touch that text with a 10-foot pole. So how do we know? We looked at earlier the Texas Receptus. There's over 5,000 editions of, of Greek texts that are Texas Receptus, but they only match 95% of the time. So how do we know? I mean, there's errors. Well, go to the bottom of this page, if you have this page here, and on the bottom here, we can see what the miracle of collation is. This is what the King James translators did, and this is how we can know what the right original text is. So, here's the original. Let's say I wrote you a letter, and there was five sentences in that letter. That's my original. Now, as soon as I wrote that, you sat down, and you copied that letter, but you made a mistake, and you left out the first line. And then you made a copy of that letter, but you made a mistake, and you forgot to copy the second line. And then back there, you made a copy, but you left out the third line, and, right, and all the way down. So here we have five different copies of my letter, and every one of them has a mistake. And then my original, I crumple up and throw it in the dump. Can we ever get back to the original? Is it possible? Yes. If we take all those texts and put them together, all the copies, for everyone that's missing something, there's four other witnesses that had it in it. So we sit down with all four of those, and we say, oh, well, this is what, and we have five different sentences at the end, and we came to the very original that we began with, even though it doesn't exist anymore. So is it possible to have the originals today? Yes, and the King James translators magnified that a thousand times. They had 5,000, and they looked at them all and said, okay, they all agree in this, so this is what we'll put. They all agree, and oh, this one's missing it, but there's another 4,999 that have it. So we, and that's how we got the King James Bible from the pure text. Even though man can make errors and mistakes, because you copy more and more and more, you can take the majority text read and get to the original. That gives me goosebumps thinking about the miracle. That's the King James Bible. So the last page is some attacks and textual changes. We're almost done. But most of your modern fundamentalists, fundamentalists dogmatically claim, no, no, it's okay to have a new Bible. No major fundamental doctrine of faith is affected in these new versions. Bunk. That's a lie. There are so many attacks. We've got attacks on the de Jesus Christ, attack on the deity of Christ, attack on salvation. All right, read this at your leisure. There's just not time to go through this today. But there are attacks. There's lies. Go to the next page. Lies in new versions. If you have a new version of the Bible, let me ask you a question. Who killed Goliath? Who killed Goliath? No, he didn't, if you have a new version. It was Elhanan killed Goliath. Well, which one's right? Well, the Bible says that Elhanan, the King James, says he killed the brother of Goliath. 
But new versions say he killed Goliath. So we have a lie in new versions. We can't sing that little children's song, David killed Goliath. We have, Elhanan killed Goliath. I mean, you have to change your doctrine. Um, new versions read in the prophets, or they change in the prophets to Isaiah the prophet. Well, there's a quote there of two prophets. So when you change that to Isaiah the prophet, you made a lie, and you have Isaiah quoting something that Malachi said. That's not right. So there's just 2 Corinthians 4.14. New versions change. We shall rise by Jesus to we shall rise with Jesus. Now if we're going to rise with Jesus, where is Jesus? He must still be in the grave. Don't tell me that doesn't affect doctrine. You just made Jesus Christ in the grave waiting to rise with me someday. You see how... Why is it read like that? You say, well, that's just errors. No, it's a demonic influence of Satanists and demons that hate Jesus. So they attack his deity. They want him in the grave. So they change just a word here and there that leaves him there. And they laugh and snicker because innocent Christians are too dumb to realize it. Isn't that a shame? On average, new versions contain 60,000 words less than the King James Bible. That's a lot of words taken out. Some of the many whole verses in just a list. I can't put all this information. I'm going through this. One of the worst things that they do is you can see Satan's dirty work in which he attempts to steal the title of God for himself. This might be in other versions, but I know for sure in the, non, the NIV, you go to Isaiah 14, 12, it says, Lucifer, son of the morning. But if you go to the NIV, it says, Lucifer, O morning star. Well, Jesus is the morning star. Right. So why would that version change the name of Lucifer to the name of Jesus? Unless Lucifer is behind it and he wants the name of Jesus to himself so he gets the worship. Because in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus is the bright and morning star. We're almost done. We, we actually made it. Woo so um, <laughs> Here's another thing about the, the New International Version I'm reading right here above the picture. One more thing about the New International Version, the NIV, is one of the translators was a, a woman named Virginia Mollencott, who later came out in Christianity Today and said that he, uh, uh, she, uh, was a lesbian. He, um, she, also stated that he, uh, or she, took out, uh, every time the King James Bible used the word sodomite, changing it to temple male prostitute. Well, she herself was a sodomite, so she tried to cast the blame over to men instead of women. Do you see how her bias affected the doctrine? So below is a picture of Miss, uh, or, um, Mr. Well, the Thing <laughs> called Virginia Mollica. Is that a man or a woman? Can you tell? <laughs> Do we want women translating the Bible when um, Eve couldn't translate it right in the beginning in Genesis? She left out the word freely. Do we want homosexuals? I said, King James was a homosexual. No, he wasn't. But this lady was. Sure enough. And uh, so there's many... Omissions taken out. Uh, right there it talks about the New King James. People say, oh, well, the New King James is good. No, 1,200 places they chose to go with the critical bad text rather than the King James. So last page, and we are finished. It says, liberals and apostates have no authority. So they try to become their own authority. And they want to say, I know what the Bible says. Okay, where is it? Well, we don't have it. If you went down to First Baptist Church and you asked the man, hey, where's the Bible? He'd say, well, you see this shelf over here? He'd pick up all these books. He goes, it's all in here somewhere. Because in his mind, it was inspired, but it wasn't preserved. And only he's smart enough to find and pick and choose which is right and which isn't. Because that's what he's been taught, and that's what Westcott and Hort did, and all these other guys did, is they thought they were smart enough to decide the Word of God, so only they can tell you what it says. That's ridiculous. So they stand in judgment of the word to decide for themselves what it says. Because of this attitude, they don't mind changing it. There's no reverence. And they do. Sadly, many who change it are deceived and spiritually influenced by satanic forces. And when they change it, it does affect doctrine. So that's why when we read the verse in the beginning, 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Yeah, yeah, they have. Uh, like this lesbian who translated the Bible... And then came out and said, no, no, I'm, I'm homosexual. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This explains why new versions do such evil things as leave out the words forever from 1 Peter 2.13. 1 Peter 2.13 says that the word of God endureth forever, but not in new versions. Well then, that's because they don't believe it exists. They don't believe in preservation. So, there are many, many different things. Um, here are just a couple verses. I'll finish by reading these verses. Proverbs 35, we read, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield of them that put their trust in Him. 
Every word of God is pure unless you have a new version. And you can't tell which is God's word and which is man's. So you're left wondering, uh, what did he really say? Uh, Matthew 4.4, 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man should not been, live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And you know what new versions do? They take out the words, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs> How are you supposed to live by them if they're not giving them to you? They're cutting them out. John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Um, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now look what Jesus said. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him the word. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So God's going to judge people with the King James Bible one day. Because that is his word, because it comes from the right side, the right text. Um, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also think we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is of truth, the word of God which professedly worketh also in you that believe. People in Paul's time accepted the true word. And we read earlier there was people corrupting it. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints of merit as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we'll finish with this last paragraph. I'm glad you're all awake. <laughs> I hope I didn't. I had to go fast. But In conclusion, the true word of God is powerful and pure. And what is the true word of God? The King James is the only one that comes from the right side, so it's the only powerful and pure one. And that shows us why in history there's been more revival from the King James Bible. And there's no revival today with over 200 different ones that come from a whore giving out tainted milk. These new versions that claim to be Bibles are not pure, nor are they powerful, even though they might be plentiful today. They have not produced revival, rather apostasy, and we not produced by godly men, rather by vile and wicked cross-dressers and evil people who doubted the word of God to begin with. The origin is not from the God's fountain of Jerusalem and Antioch, rather from Satan's fountain of pagan philosophy, Alexandria, and false religion, Rome. They do not seek to unite Christians under one standard and authority, like the King James. Rather, they seek to enslave people back under the yoke of Rome, because that's the whole agenda of New Versions, is to take you back to the Latin Vulgate and the Roman Catholic Church. And um, they are not milk from God that we may grow thereby, rather putrid milk from a great whore of Babylon, to poison us and lead us to destruction. These New Versions should have warning labels like the one below. So there it is. I wish we could have gotten into some of the verses that show the changing of the doctrine and everything, but go ahead, Joe. Well, what's your opinion about using the uh, concordance to see how particular Greek or Hebrew words used? That's, that's interesting. That's a completely different teaching, but that's what this book is about. Yeah. Hazardous materials. The, the guy that made the first uh, concordance of the Bible was a friend of Westcott and Hortz. Okay. And what he did is he took the Greek from the pagans and put that into his dictionary. That's how the word can be translated. Rather than using the Bible itself. So that's why new versions, when it said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. King James is the only one that tells us that she's a virgin conceiving. All the other ones change it to, And a young maiden, maiden shall conceive. So see, that takes out the doctrine of the virgin birth. There's some words that it's hard to see how it's being used in context. It kind of doesn't explain it. How do you find out what it really means? Well, I've got in my Bible a neat little thing. Um, I got this probably from Chick Tracks. And it says there's like over 500 words that most people say, it's hard to mean, it's hard to know. And then they tell you what it is and where it's used in other passages so you can look it up. So let the Bible defend itself. 